Hi, everyone. I cannot tell you how excited I am to pull the interview of the year. I mean, I mean Alex and I go way back, uh, like at least three, four weeks, maybe a month. Uh, we've been BFFs. Um, so I am just so happy to have Alex on here because we're going to talk all things uh, sports and mostly Arizona. I've been following Alex so long on Twitter. I've been stalking you for quite some time. Uh, and as always, just to let you know before I bring you, uh, introduce you in, um, you know, this is brought to you by fantasy six pack.net. Please come on down, become a subscriber today and you can see more cool things like these interviews here. So Alex, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. No problem. Um, and I learned right before the pre-show when we were talking that I've been mispronouncing your name this whole time, which congratulations. I mispronounced everybody's name up here. <laughs> so, I'm so sorry. So, uh, don't worry about it. Everyone mispronounces my name. So, and just for those viewers at home, do not ignore the apostrophes. D'Agostino, right? You yep. got that? Yes. Yep, that's it. All right, all right. That is a. I'm just writing myself. I get to have ice cream after the show. I got that right. So, uh, okay. so, so for those for those people that haven't followed you on Twitter, who aren't obsessed with you and have shirts like I do. You tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, all, all the things that I'd see once they start following you. Yeah. Um, so I just, I spend probably way too much time on Twitter, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I cover the, the Cardinals and the Diamondbacks and I have an opinion on everything and I like to share that. Um, you know, I like to share stats. I like to give coverage of the game, transactions, whatnot. Um, you know, I, I, just, just one of those people that never gets off the internet. But um, I do write for a couple of websites covering uh, the Cardinals and the Diamondbacks. So I have a little bit to back up what I'm saying on the internet. But <laughs> Sure. <laughs> well, you know, actually, before we get into one of the set questions, I got to ask now because it just popped in my head. Uh, of all, you know, of the sports you cover, which is the one that causes you to have the most arguments would be the best thing? Disagreements? Um, on Twitter, football. Or um, I, yeah, it's. I think football. If the Cardinals weren't so much of a like, we kind of know what's going on with the Cardinals right now. They're not very good. It might be a little bit more contentious. Although right. I, I have some arguments with people on in that side too. But I, I think baseball is definitely a little bit more um, intense right now, just because there's, you know, it's a there's a hot playoff race going on. There's players that have been really streaky they're really good or really bad uh, you know i try to defend players and then every i, I there's this running gag on my twitter every time i try to defend one of our relievers he immediately just blows up in the next <laughs> outing and like proves me wrong and i'm like you got to be right. kidding me so i i defended paul seawald on on twitter the other day and the next save was like this close to being completely blown <laughs> so now i know what who to bet on to give up a home run so if you are defending that person the day before you should basically just bet heavily yeah, not I, saying we should gamble you, i mean we're talking just betting amongst your friends but sure. you know just you can bet heavily that that guy most likely will give up a home run got it i'm just making Probably, i'm just making yeah. notes just <laughs> yeah just for myself don't worry okay just bet yeah. against alex got it no problem perfect <laughs> so um, all right. I would love to know it's something I always ask people, like, what was the first game you ever watched? You know, what was the first kind of team you were rooting for? You know, tell, tell me a little bit more about your fandom. For for baseball, football, both, either? A anything? Any, anything. I mean, if you're in Arizona hockey, hey, you know what? Let's go for it. Yeah. Yeah. Um... So I was raised as a football fan. I mean, my dad okay. was a Giants fan. He's not so much anymore just because of what they look like. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I was raised like that. I was kind of like, as a kid, always really into football. That was kind of the thing every Sunday. And so I think the first game I really remember, like, paying attention to because it was always on. But when I really started watching it was like, I think it was like the 2006 Super Bowl with like the Bears and Colts, I think was the first time I really kind of fell in love with the game. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I'm so a Bears like a, fan. So thanks. Oh, you are? Oh, no, yeah. Man. Sorry. Yeah, it's it's OK. Way. Yeah. I was so excited with that. You know, Hester started that off with that kickoff, you know, uh -huh. with that kickoff return for the touchdown. And I was like, yeah, we have a chance and we never going to score again. 
Um, that was awesome. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Well, so we should talk more here. before the show. Yeah. Let's talk before the show next time to things not to bring up. Those are, you know, okay. Deal. Together. Yeah. Thanks. That's my bad. Um, <laughs> at least you didn't watch your quarterback throw a like 95 yard pick six. So, um, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, but so, anyways, so yeah. That, so that's how you started football. Um, I guess then what was the first baseball game? Do you remember your first baseball game? Was it a New York team as well? Or, you know, how did you get involved? No. You know, how did you start like baseball? Yeah, because I've lived in Arizona pretty much my whole life. So okay. I, I was never super into baseball as a kid. I went to a Diamondbacks game here and there. I didn't really pay that much attention to it. It felt like a really complicated game to me. Um, but gosh, I don't even remember at this point really what the first exact baseball game I watched. Sure, sure, sure. But I really, I really sort of started following them like you know obviously like the goldschmidt days like those kind of things i knew about that i i followed them a little bit i wasn't as much of a student of the game as i am now uh i really started to get into them a couple years ago more so like following baseball like as okay. a nerd but <laughs> <laughs> uh, no so so just walk me through this so your dad's from new york your mom is from yeah. arizona or okay and then all right no, now, now it makes from, She's actually from Colorado. They just kind of like ended up there. I was born there. I lived there my whole life. Um, wow. And I went to school up in Washington, surrounded by my worst nightmare Seahawks fans. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but so, um, so you all basically love cold weather, apparently. And then you're just like, forget this. We're never shoveling snow again. We're going to Arizona. Is, is that how that worked out? I, I would assume so. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and then then we started to, you know. I, I mean, I was born there, so I, I pretty much never experienced anything other than that until I moved up to Washington, and I was like, right. wow, the snow sucks. So, <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Okay. Well, that, that makes a lot more sense. Um, all right. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Oh, so, you know, how did you get your start covering sports? You were kind of talking about, you know, how complicated baseball is, although, you know, I, I'm a big football fan, but trying to explain, uh, you know, past interference over the years has been you know, it still caused some problems. Um, yeah. But how did you get started covering sports on a more regular basis? Yeah, so I went to um, I went to school for journalism. I didn't really know that's what I wanted to study at all until like my sophomore year, junior year, and then I was okay. I got really into like that whole idea, and then I was like wait a minute, like, I love sports, this is what I want to do. And then I was like, that's it. Like, I, I'm going to be a sports journalist. Like, I don't know why it took me so long to come up with that. Honestly, like, it was really down to the wire, right? I set myself up because I went to a really small school with a small journalism program. So they didn't have sports specific classes and whatnot. Um, so I ended up getting an internship working for a local sports uh, news network in uh, Spokane, Washington. Oh, and okay. um, so I got an internship there, then uh, kind of learned the business a little bit, learned the field. They ended up hiring me part time to help uh, sort of film and produce their uh, high school show. And um, and then that kind of ended. I graduated. They didn't really call me again after that. Um, but Those uh, jerks. I was like. I, I know, but I something I realized in that process was I really wanted to be more of a writer than a, like television news. So oh, really? I was like, yeah, I was like, I kind of think I'm my strong suit is in like sort of writing, being like a beat writer, or, like covering that more print digital media. Um, so I basically just kind of started writing at that point. I started writing for like on medium, writing like articles for myself and putting them out there, I started like really, really trying on Twitter to be as like professional as I can. And I am surprised that I was able to get the following that I got because that's I never really pictured that happening. And so the more attention I got, the more encouraged I was to keep doing it. And I was like, awesome, like people care what I have to say. I'm just like, I don't know, I just have opinions. Um, right. And then I, I signed up for, or I applied for, to write for a site called Fan Sided. I don't know if yep, yep, you've heard absolutely. of that. Yeah, uh, it's, sure. it's, you know, very fan driven, more like blogs, opinions and whatnot, but I had a really right. good experience. I still write for them. I write for Venom Strikes, which is the Diamondbacks site. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I did that for a while. 
until a guy reached out to me um, on Twitter. So paying off again. Um, and he was like, hey, I am the editor and like publisher for All Cardinals, which is the Sports Illustrated affiliate right. site for the Cardinals. And he was like, hey, I'm looking to add a contributor. Are you interested? And I was like, yes. And uh, he's great. His name's Donnie Druin. Follow him on Twitter. Uh, read his articles. He's great. Super nice guy. Really good at coverage. Um, and so I've just been doing that this season. So I, I've got a long ways to go, but it's been a, it's been a good journey so far. Sounds like it. I mean, that's that's an I mean, look, I think uh, it always surprises anybody when their opinions matter. Uh, so, right. you know, <laughs> I, I, I guess when, when, when did you feel like you'd finally made it is kind of an overused term. But, you know, when did you feel like you finally were like, whoa, I can't believe I've gotten to this point. Was it when you made, you know, the sort of doing stuff on Venom Strikes or when SI reached out to you? Or is it, you know, somewhere earlier where you're like, I can't believe this one particular tweet got like 41 responses or something like that. What, what was that moment for you? Yeah, um, I think it, it was kind of a gradual process on Twitter of seeing like people following me, people liking my stuff, like getting views. I never really did it for the attention, but I was like, didn't really expect that much of it. And I was like, this is cool. But really, when Donnie reached out to me, that was when I realized, because like, I mean, he's he's a credentialed member of the media. Like he's, right. he, it, it was somebody that I was like respected in the community that was like, hey, I've read your stuff. And Right. You do a good job. And I was that I was really like, wow, I'm I'm actually I'm actually not <laughs> terrible at this. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, uh, well, spoiler alert, you're not. Um, I have, like I said, I've been following you for a while. Venom Strikes as well. Um, just a note to people watching. Uh, Fan sided is phenomenal, especially when I want to find out more about, uh, you know, going a little bit beyond the headlines, especially if I'm looking at trades or if I'm looking at, you know, does this player actually suck? You know, I can look at, you know, all types of things, stats. And if I'm kind of still on the fence, I look at fan I look at kind of these fan driven um, sites because I like to see, you know, if except for the Yankees, <laughs> because it just seems like they're just like, you know, kill everyone. This guy sucks, yeah. you know, uh, like <laughs> except for that kind of fandom, I, there's, there's, there's a lot of intelligent fans out there that really have, kind of you can put a lot more context in there. And we're going to get to a couple of the players there that um, I can't wait to talk about with you because I know that that will definitely cause some conversation. But before we do that, <laughs> I need to ask you. Um, I used to go to Phoenix two or three times a month. I used to have a, a sales patch out there and I used to love you know, the Phoenix area. It's one of my favorite places, especially downtown Phoenix. Uh, but from your perspective, I mean, yes, we could say hockey as well. But do you think Arizona is more of a football or baseball or shoot basketball town? Yeah, so I think that the football is kind of still king in the U.S., um, but I think Phoenix is a basketball town. I think Arizona is a basketball state. Uh, really? I mean, you look, I'm from, yeah, I'm from Tucson. U of A basketball is huge down there. I mean, that's just like, huge yep. asu basketball has been climbing up uh the suns have had a resurgence but i think it, it really has to do kind of with the history because yeah. like the cardinals came to phoenix in like what 1988 the diamondbacks in 98 so there's not really a long long history of right. having those teams there um the suns have been around for a longer much longer time so they're kind of like the home the homegrown team as far right. as the other two teams go, they were either an expansion team or a relocation. And so I think a lot of people there are like a Suns fan and then like a Packers fan or a Jets fan or like a Niners fan sure. or something. Sure. And that's right. not necessarily a bad thing, but I think the responsibility is on the ownership of like the Diamondbacks and the Cardinals to create that winning culture and appeal to the younger generations, the, the people that are growing up there with those teams. Because a sure. lot of the transplants from across the country like have their own teams already. Right. Um, so that was actually a trick question. I just want to let you know um, because the answer is any sports indoors is the number one sports in uh, Arizona. That's a fair because... point. <laughs> <You> <laughs> but I will say this. More popular. <laughs> exactly. You know, the thing is, I, I couldn't believe in a lot of people know that, you know, spring trainings that, you know, out there, but you know, you gotta understand the winter. I mean, not you, but you know, winter ball is there. Um, there's so many things going on constantly that I was running into athletes all the time. I was, I was staying at the W 
uh, down in Phoenix. Um, and I was running into athletes or agents all the time. It was crazy to me. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, of course, you know, uh, the Phoenix Suns or whatever team. Uh, and if you if you ever want to DM me on Twitter, I can tell you exactly where they stay. I ran into just many players. Uh, but, <laughs> yeah. you know, it was just it was just nuts to me because even the transplants, like you said, um, you know, they would be like, well, uh, I'm originally from, you know, the L.A. area or I'm, I'm a snowbird from Florida. But, you know, my team when I'm here is X, Y, Z. And you're absolutely right. I think if ownership stays consistent, uh, you know, that does a lot. Um, and, you know, with some of the things that are happening right now at the time of X, there's a lot to be excited about. But, yeah, yeah. I I mean, UA and uh, UA, ASU basketball, I got to see that once in person. I mean, the rivalry is amazing. I, and if you haven't had a chance to, even baseball, too, um, it, it's phenomenal. So definitely uh, would like everybody to have at least one chance there as well. But let's get into baseball that's why we're here i know i spent a long time here but like i said you're you're so, you're so interesting to me and it's something i really want to delve into but let's talk diamondbacks because that's why we're here but okay so who are some of the top three or four your or less it could be one hey i don't know uh your favorite diamondbacks right now that maybe people do not realize how good they are and you know outside of the corbin carols of the world and and all that fun stuff and the kettle marques you know who are those people? Yeah, um, obviously. So I'll just like glaze over him real quick because we've already talked about Gabby Moreno. Um, but he is phenomenal. People don't realize how good he is. I'll just say this. They are 54 and 33 when Gabby starts. They are 27 and 39 when he does not start. So. Well, what about his defense? I, I don't know. I guess he can't <laughs> turn a ball that's all the way over here into a strike. So he must be terrible, right? I mean, um, his framing metric. I mean, no, that's me being sarcastic. I'm completely on board with you. I uh, I did an NL preview of the AL Diamondbacks. I mean, the um, the Arizona Diamondbacks. AL Diamondbacks. Arizona Diamondbacks. Okay. is preseason, and that was one of my key people. I was like, look, he may not get you there right away, but his growth over the year has been phenomenal on both yeah. sides of the plate. And I I, I just he's only going to get more comfortable with the pitching, and he's only going to get better. And the, the amount of hate he's getting is ridiculous. So, yes, you and I completely yeah. agree. Thank you um, so much for bringing that up. There's Big Gabby. Big issue. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, another one that I think has really been clutch, and I think if you look at his numbers, they're not insane, but if you actually pay attention to what he's doing in games, he's been huge, is Tommy Pham. Um, he wasn't incredibly good to start out with the Diamondbacks. His numbers were pretty bad. It was kind of like, why did we trade for this guy? Like, what what's going on here? Um, but right. I would say the situational hitting is kind of what he's um, – what he's really bringing to the table. He has 11 RBI in September so far. So he's coming up big in those big moments. I honestly, I can't even go back and tell you how many games would have been dead in the water if he didn't hit a home run or if he didn't tie the game or if he didn't walk it off like against the Rangers a while back. I mean, he's not going to have the craziest, flashiest numbers. He's 35, but he can hit the ball when he needs to. So um, the thing, the thing about Tommy Pham, real quick, just before we go any further, is two things. I've always loved his toughness. The guy just seems like he could beat up anybody on the field, and that's not somebody that, that would, obviously. But he just, he just brings that. Like, if you have that person on your bench that you just feel is like big, tough dude, like Tommy's the guy. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I saw, I've been following him for quite some time, and. I mean, and we, I talked about this, and I don't mean to joke about it, but, you know, the waiver wire show we did with Tommy, uh, you know, we called him out. I forgot he was the guy that got stabbed, and I couldn't believe that he came back. I mean, the, 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 as gruesome as that injury was, and he comes back, and I'm like, this guy is a guy that I would, like, straight up just get behind. Like, he's like the, Mel, you know, the Mel Gibson Braveheart guy. Like, okay, whatever Tommy's <laughs> doing, like, I'm going to be behind him, but I'm pretty sure we'll be okay if we're behind him. And, like, so just seeing his, like, you know, late game heroics and seeing as he's again progressed and grown i completely see that and completely agree with you 100 percent. if you don't have uh you know tommy fam somewhere he's always a great play especially on these kind of season long um you know best ball leagues we kind of just have him because he's always he always seems to peak at some point and it's just it's a great ad so yeah keep going i apologize yeah no you're good and that's i think that's exactly why they brought him on too they wanted somebody who was kind of that veteran leadership in the right. clubhouse because i mean all of the guys are so young right now. I mean, you got like Christian Walker maybe is like the, the oldest guy besides fam. It, you know, 
they needed right. somebody in the outfield who was like a mentor and kind of a leader there. So I, I think that's that's worked out really well. Um, okay, moving on, Merrill Kelly. Um, yeah. You look at our pitching rotation, you think, who's the ace? It's Zach Gallen. Well, right. Merrill Kelly has been just as good, if not more consistently good than Gallen for like a couple of years now. I mean, he is the model of consistency. They call him Merrill the mainstay for a reason. He has an oh, wow. identical he has an identical 3.37 ERA to last year at this point in the season. He was 13 and 8 last year. He's 12 and 7 with two more starts to go this year. Um, so obviously he's had kind of some a little bit of issues this year. He's had the blood clot in his leg that kept him out on the IL for a yeah. while. He's had yeah. a couple of issues with cramping late in games. But even in those starts, he was dealing. I mean, he was getting 9, 10 Ks. He was going deep. He came out for the eighth inning before he had to leave with a cramp. So he's consistent. He works the zone. He catches guys looking like four or five times a game sometimes. It's crazy. I don't know how he does it. He's just got a range of stuff. He's calm, never really gives up. His only real issue is kind of having a bit of a walk problem. He sometimes tends to to nibble around at the zone, but most of the time he's able to sort of like keep guys guessing, tie him up with some of those off-speed pitches. Got it. Wow. I I, I do love Merrill Kelly and uh, I love crafty veterans. And I, you know what? I didn't know that. I didn't know how close their stats were. And thanks for pointing out that. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. He's from well, homegrown before... guy too from ASU. Oh, really? Yep. See, things, things I didn't know. Things I didn't know. Uh, anybody else in your list? I, I didn't want to. I'm sorry. I, I keep cutting you off. I just get so excited. Some of the names are dropping. Oh, you're good. Um, I'd say, yeah. Okay. I have one more. I do have one more. Okay. Uh, Alec right. Thomas. Alec Thomas oh, yeah. has been unbelievable in center field. He, You can't get anything past him. If it is staying in the yard, he is catching it. Sometimes if it's going to leave the yard, he still gets it. Um, I mean, he's in the 92nd percentile in range. So outs above average, like he's there. He's at every single ball, every series. There's a highlight play of him running down some ball and catching something over his shoulder. It's just ridiculous. Uh, he's fast on the base paths. He's his bat needs a little bit of work, but he has been getting better. He hit a three run nuke off of Justin Steele the other day. And I was like, wow. Never seen him hit a lefty like that. <laughs> right. You know, the thing that surprises me about Alec Thomas, I was looking this up the other day, is that he is four months younger than Corbin Carroll. Mm -hmm. And I was, you know, Alec Thomas to me is, I always constantly talk about this. There's some names that are, I feel like have been out there for a while. And I feel like Alec Thomas has been, it seems like he's been a diamond back for longer than he actually has been. And when I was like, he's actually younger than Corbin Carroll. I mean, that blew me away. I mean, that again, shows you that there's tons of development still available. And the fact that he plays defense as well as he does, like you just talked about. I mean, that's one of those things that, you know, instincts and yes, you can teach some defense as we've seen with um, uh, Jared Duran at, um, you know, with the Red Sox, who was just terrible at defense last year and it looks a lot better now, but I mean, Alex has a lot of really amazing instincts that you, I don't think you can teach. And hopefully, like you said, his bat no, will come yeah. around next. And, but yes, uh, hitting a ball off, um, off a Cy Young, you know, favorite is definitely the way to go. <laughs> yeah. Day of the week. Uh, yeah. And, all and right. I, I make a joke with, with him. I'm like the entire pitching staff, like owes him a case of beer or something like that. A steak dinner. I don't know. Cause he saves Absolutely. there. He saves them pretty much like once or twice per series, at least. <laughs> He's the offensive line guy, you know, the, you know, how the quarterbacks go in and give everybody Rolexes or whatever to the offensive yes. line. He, he's that guy for them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, okay. So, so that kind of gets us with the kind of, I wouldn't say off the beaten path, but you know, the gallons of the world, not, not those names, some of the other people and some people that, as you could tell, I'm, I love to hear the, their names being called out, but who do you think is a player of players? Uh, again, I'm, I'm never going to hold you back from saying more than one. Um, that you think it's like one adjustment away. Um, you know, we talked about right, right now, for example, Alec Thomas is, you know, needs a little bit of help on with his bat, but he's great here. But one adjustment away from going to the next level, and this could be prospects as well that you've seen, but just, you know, anybody in the uh, Diamondbacks organization. Yeah. Um, so I think there's one guy who in particular keeps showing flashes of 
what he really can do. It's just like had some very glaring issues. And that's Brandon Fott. Um, he's it's Fott. Was our, is that fat? It's Fott. Yep. <laughs> the old pronunciation strikes again, huh? <laughs> All these puns that I've been using with this guy. Oh. Right, Don't I'm worry. The, it's nothing that the Diamondbacks social media team hasn't already made, probably. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead, please. <laughs> right, right, right. Oh. Um, he, I, like, I won't sugarcoat it. He was awful in his first couple starts. He got sent back down. He came back. He wasn't any better. He got sent down. He came back. Started to turn the corner a little bit. He has a major home run problem. Now, I'm not talking about last night, because if Aaron Judge hits two home runs off you, that's a normal, you know, Friday right. night. But he has that home run problem still. But each start I'm seeing, he's working the zone better. He's using his breaking pitches more. He has crazy movement on that sweeper. I mean, it just kind of like, it, it, it's crazy. It's a great pitch. His issue is kind of his fastball, I think because he needs to sort of work the margins of the zone a little bit more. He's sending it straight down the middle. He's throwing it in predictable counts. He needs to be a little smarter with it. You're, you're up 1-2, 0-2, 1-2 Aaron Judge, and he throws a middle-middle fastball. I get what he's trying to do. He's trying to not be afraid of him. You can't do right. that to Aaron Judge, and you can't do that right. to a lot of hitters either. Um, right. So he needs to keep tweaking those breaking pitches, keeping them just as a little bit closer to the zone, making them a little bit more competitive. And he needs to be a little smarter with his selection and location of his fastball, but he's showing that he can do it. Each start he's had since the third time he's been called up has been better and better and better. And Tori Lovello is giving him a shorter leash and not allowing him to die out there. And I think that'll be big for his confidence. Like maybe he only goes four and a third innings. Maybe he goes five. That's better than sticking him out there for six and having him give up back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back home runs like he did against the Reds a while back. Um, but I think he's getting there. He's getting there. He's just got a few more things to, to tweak. Got it. Um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that he was so dominant in the minors, and he was definitely somebody I, you know, I, I picked up a lot of places, and I called out as both in the NL team preview – and his waiver wire selection, and he would, like you said, he was just so bad in those first couple games. But he's also a rookie, and I mean, we've seen that happen. I mean, it's it's a rarity. I think it, it almost becomes something because of the fact we live in a Twitter age that we've seen some of these people just yes. dominate the first two, three games up. But then we forget also that those people that dominate then suddenly suck. That you know, the same time they you know see that same team the second time because advanced scouting. And because these are professional hitters that know what they're doing. Uh, but I think you're right. It, it, you know, I've seen such a change with him, even the second time when he wasn't so good again. But there was a definite change. And you're right. Maybe the shorter leash will definitely help out. Do you think he needs to add another pitch to his repertoire? Or do you think he needs to, um, or is it just a location thing? Or is it a selection thing? And why is all of the issues that he has tied to your catcher? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh. No, I think he needs to work on mainly uh, like working on pitching smarter. Like I said, not throwing a, a one-two fastball to Aaron Judge. Um, another thing, the breaking stuff is disgusting. It's great. It's just yep. more selection based, like when to use that properly. Because when he does use them well, they're unbelievable. Um, I'd say it's location of the fastball and decision making and working counts a little bit better. And I think I think it's there because the, the velo is there. It's not right. like he's throwing meatballs. It's just he's kind of still leaving it over the plate a little too much. And I think right. he can work that. He can get better. Yeah, the thing was, so first off, just in case no one knows, uh, right, I don't know how you couldn't, but, you know, we're talking about a person who led the minor leagues or was close to leading the minor leagues in strikeouts last year. You mm -hmm. don't suddenly lose that ability. Uh, I think you have to then, of course, change your strategy and be like, oh, well, you know, I blew this particular ball, like you just said, a fastball, you know, by minor leaguers. Yeah, you can't do that. But the thing that was kind of worrisome to me is when he went back down to the minors, I don't know if it was just his confidence was shot, but he was so bad when he went back, back down to the minors yeah. a couple of times. And again, I don't know if it was a confidence thing or maybe the, you know, the team was like, look, when you go to the minors, you do not throw this pitch anymore. You throw this, these pitches, work on these pitches. And we've seen that in spring training too, where, you know, somebody has like a 
12 ERA, and then suddenly the you know season starts, and they're like, well, yeah, because I was not allowed to throw a fastball. I had to throw all curveballs, no matter what it was. And you're like, oh, that's why your ERA was terrible. Sure. So that was a little concerning there, you know, when he went back down. But you know, I, I like I like you said, and like we've kind of seen, you know, there, the progression's definitely there. And yeah, Aaron Judge is going to destroy a lot of people. I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, there's not a whole <laughs> lot Judge. you can do about him besides maybe pitch around him. And I think he probably should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> And I mean, at the same time, too, like next year when he sees them, it's going to be like, OK, you know what? The worst possible things already happened. I can't. That, so it's not you're going to start getting to the point where there's a callus there where you're not going to have as much of an issue. So I definitely see that happening. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. In Dynasty, I picked him up everywhere, especially when he was cheap. Again, when people were dropping yeah. him, I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, you can't. You know, let, let me put him on the bench. So Dynasty was a great pickup as well. Um, okay. So outside of that, and I think the adjustment we're talking about was not his pitching, but his name pronunciation. So thank you for pointing that out as well, <laughs> which kills me because, oh my God, I was saying he was such a fat pitcher. That was such a fat pitch. That kills me now that I can't say that. Um, okay. So, um, other than that, is there any other players that, um, you feel like is an adjustment away? I, you know, I'm sure there are. I think right. everyone is progressing pretty well right now. Okay. Um, I, I think Fox, the biggest one, uh, basically most of our young pitchers, I think, are kind of in that. I would say the same thing for Tommy Henry. He's injured right now. I would say the same thing for Slade Ciccone. Like all those younger guys that are kind of like working their way in the rotation, having some struggles. Right. They're all probably dealing with the same type of issues as fought or needing to just get a little bit more experience in the majors. Um, they, they all have some potential except I, I don't know about Ryan Nelson. I'm not, I'm not sold on Ryan Nelson yet. If I'm completely honest, he hasn't showed me anything to make me think he's getting a whole lot better, but he could prove me wrong. I don't know. Has, okay. Let me, all right. Let me ask you a different question there. Ryan Nelson. Thank you for bringing that up. But with Ryan Nelson, you said he hasn't shown you anything, but <clears throat> was there anything that he was showing you or is it now that he's where he's at, he's not showing you adjustments or kind of where has your progress, have you progressed on your views on him or has it been something where you just always felt like it's always been lacking at least a, a tool or two? <clears throat> well, he was awesome in his like first couple starts with us last year. Um, right. And I was like, wow, like this guy, he, he can do it. I mean, his fastball velo is like, he throws like 97 yeah, I mean, the issue is he doesn't have a put away pitch and I haven't seen him really develop one. I think his breaking balls are OK, but they're not really where they are to make guys miss. They don't fool anybody. Um, I think the thing is, I at the beginning of this year, I was kind of like, eh, he's young. He'll get there. He got sent down to Reno and I was like, OK, that's good because we had Ciccone who had the hot hand. Uh, we had, uh, you know, a successful bullpen games happening. Zach Davies, you kind of know what you're getting with Zach Davies. But when Ryan got sent down to Reno, I was like, perfect. Like, leave him there for a bit. Well, had to call him right back up. And so, because I, yeah, had to call him right back up. And I was like, right. this is not going to go well. And it did not. And every start <laughs> that he's done, he's had a couple of like, starts where he was getting a lot of like barrel outs and, and fly outs and stuff like that. And it was, he, he kept the score minimum. So it was like, you know, right. 5.2 and he threw like, you know, one run ball. Awesome. Like we love that when you can bring that, but for the most part, every one of his starts has looked pretty much the same. So I'm not feeling optimistic about it, but he could totally prove me wrong. And I hope he does. Okay. Well then I'm going to ask about the player that I wonder about. Um, because maybe I'm misunderstanding him uh, and it might happen that way because, you know, I don't, I'm not, I'm going to be honest. I don't look at him every day. I look at stats sometimes, I, you know, but Christian Walker to me seems like somebody gets really hot. And then when he gets cold, he gets cold. Do I misunderstand Christian Walker? Is he just, is he, you know, a, just a step below superstar or maybe he's a superstar. I just misunderstand him or is he, or is there adjustment there that I'm not seeing? I, I always feel like I have a very love hate relationship with him. I always add him to my teams, but like I said, I always feel like he's, when he's hot, like you do not move him, but then he gets cold and he, you're like, what was I thinking? 
that is pretty spot on, unfortunately, from the offensive okay. side. <laughs> um, as a defender, he is elite. He is a gold glove sure. uh, first baseman. I can't think of any, really, any many other first basemen that I would rather have over him. There's probably a couple out there, you know, maybe, I, I don't know. There's the elite top of the top guys. Sure. He's he's pretty close to them as far as a defensive first baseman. But at the same time, you're right. He either goes four for five with two home runs or he goes 0 for 40, you know. And <laughs> yes. it is kind of frustrating because he it has, is a big power bat who can really provide a lot when he's hot. But he I don't know if he like tries to overswing or tries to do too much or what's going on. I don't know if he gets in his head, what happens, but when he gets really cold, it's yep. like, he can't buy a hit. And it's like, what are we yep. doing? He's, <laughs> he had a home run last night. That was our only run yep. the game against the Yankees, but I, that he's either hitting bombs all day or he's like popping out to shallow, like infield, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He is without a doubt, one of those players that I feel like if I understood actual mechanics better to the point where I'm just, you know, can tell them like, yeah, you know, just put your hands higher. Like, I feel like he's just right on the cusp every time. And then when he like gets in these, you know, heaters, I'm like, oh, he made an adjustment. And then he goes cold and you're like, oh, okay, he didn't. He's just using his talent and his normal. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I don't know what it is, but I wish somebody would just be like, put your hands here, start whatever, because I love when he's hot. Because when he's hot, like like you said, he's, the, he's hitting bombs and everything. He just he can see. He seems like he also can see the ball so well. But just mm -hmm. something happens with the swing mechanic. I don't know. Like I said, I'm not a mechanics coach. I'm not. I don't. I'm not from drive line. I don't pretend to be. But <laughs> man, I just I, I wish somebody would just you know give him a lighter bat, heavier bat. Heck, I don't know what it is, but I feel like he's just one thing away. And I would love to see him go full like full Christian Walker versus Christian Walker. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yes. I, I agree. That would be nice for us. Um, I, and I think part of it is like his plate discipline is seemed to take a little bit of a dive this year. I remember him kind of walking a lot last year, ironically. Yep. Um, and I feel like I haven't really seen him do that much this year. I feel like he is, uh, he's like, I am, I am hitting the ball as hard as I can. And maybe he needs to pull back on that. Maybe not. I don't know. Right. I'm not a hitting coach either. I, I, I'm just a guy who has opinions. Um, but he is Good a great opinions. player, but he's very, very streaky. Well, um, all right. So this is my last um, question here, but I, I, it's my favorite. I'm sorry. I, I, I pat myself on the back when I come up with good questions. But so on a scale from Corbin Carroll to Tim Tawa, and in case uh, for the average listener, uh, they were, we we're talking about a guy who's like, you know, on the cusp of being outside of the top prospects slash outside of top prospects. How good is Lawler? And please tell me if I'm pronouncing these names correctly, because I just found out that I messed up with Brandon's name. Uh, but how good is Lawler going to be, in your opinion? Yeah, I, I think Lawler definitely is going to be good. I think he's going to be closer to the Corbin Carroll side of things. Okay. I think him and Corbin could end up becoming a very good one-two punch. But make no mistake, Lawler is going to be the two. I don't think he's going to be Corbin Carroll, but I think he could develop his way into being a very solid uh, complimentary piece to Corbin. Um, I mean, in his, he played like 14, 15 games in AAA. He was hitting right. 328, OPS at 931. Like, Ugh. that's crazy. I, I know Reno is a hitter friendly uh, right. place to play, but I think he's got everything it takes. And again, people criticize his defense. The only real highlight he has in the majors so far is a defensive highlight. So yes. he's got the defense, he's got the speed. He just kind of needs to adjust to major league pitching, I think, because he seemed kind of lost at the plate. He's also been getting squeezed very hard by these umpires sometimes. I'm seeing them calling the most ridiculous strike calls on him. Maybe it's just being a rookie. I don't know. But he hasn't gotten quite enough time to adjust, I think. Tori kind of took him out of the lineup. He's like, look, I get it. You're in a playoff push. You need to win all these games. You can't have a guy figuring it out that's i wrote a whole article about ryan nelson in this regard you can't afford to have a guy trying to figure things out in a playoff push but i think lawler will be good he just needs a little bit more he needs to see a little bit more major league pitching and get some confidence because i think that could be that could be big for him 
you, you know, we uh, I, I glazed over Corbin real quickly, but I mean, what? I don't care. Yes, the stolen bases are, you know, inflated. I get it, right? You know, these new pickoff rules, especially people don't talk enough about the pickoff rule, um, you know, really kind of helping with the stolen bases because once they go twice over, they're not going to, it can't go a third. Uh, yeah. But I, I mean, I mean, almost a 30 60 season. I mean, yeah, yes, Acuna's doing Acuna stuff is crazy, but I mean, come oh, on. Yeah. This guy, second, I mean, second year, I mean, sorry, rookie. I apologize. Uh, he's rookie, a rookie, he's uh, a rookie of the year. <laughs> I know. I, know I, I still can't. Yeah. In the team, uh, team preview, I was like, I can't believe he's still under, you know, the, um, the, the limit of rookies. Uh, yeah. He's definitely the rookie of the year. I mean, that if that's not unanimous, I, people's credentials should be taken away. But yeah, I did agree. you think he was, <laughs> did you think he was going to be this good from what you've seen um, before this season? I mean, did you, I mean, we all expect him to be good, but this level already, yeah, honestly, in Reno, he looked incredible. And I actually have a fun story about that. I was at his debut Please. game at Chase Field, um, which was awesome. And I didn't realize he was getting called up that day um, until I, I'd already gotten the ticket. So I'd been trying to go to a game, and I was like, oh, I'll go to this game. And then I ended up looking at the schedule and changing my mind and going with the tickets to a different game okay. uh, in August of last year. and that day I got the notification that he was getting called up and I was like, Man. Whoa, like <laughs> I get to go to Corbin Carroll's first game. And right. I knew he was going to be good from that moment. I mean, I was sitting there largest comeback in D backs franchise history, by the way, down seven, nothing. Cause Bumgarner just exploded for three innings. Um, yeah. And worked their way all the way back up. Corbin's first major league hit, two-run double to take the lead to complete the comeback. Chase Field erupted. I have never heard it be that loud before. It was insane. And I think from that moment, I was like, this guy is going to be really, really good. And he has been. And he's lived up to the hype. <laughs> How fast is he live? Like, I mean, he I, looks speedy on the TV. <laughs> he's – it's crazy. I mean, he was turning – he, he, he hit a couple of balls or, or like one or two where, well, because his first hit was an error. So he hit two right. balls, one that I was like, there's no way he's beating that out. And he did. <laughs> and then the other one, I was like, oh, okay, like a, a short single. No, he stretches it into a double easily. I'm like, it's insane. <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. He's, I mean, again, I'm, I'm an Oakland A's fan. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not shy about it. I got the hat up there, but, um, well, sorry, Vegas A's, whatever. But, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, but Corbin Carroll is one of my favorite players. I, I love anybody that hustles as hard as he does, plays just absolute, just all out on both sides of the ball. He's so much fun to watch, and I couldn't be happier that he's going to start getting some more hardware to put on his mantle. Uh, just the start of an amazing career that he's going to have. It's, Kudos yeah. to you guys. Um, I'm, I'm so happy you get, you get to watch him as much as you do, like you jerks. But <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not jealous at all. Not jealous at all. Uh, but Alex, um, so now uh, please tell people um, where they can catch you. I know you covered some of that, but please tell them where they can find you uh, other than just on Twitter. Yeah, so obviously I'm, you know, Alex Dagaz on Twitter. Otherwise, you can find me. I write for VenomStrikes.com on FanSided or All Cardinals FN, which is part of the Sports Illustrated Fan Nation uh, uh, publication. So, yeah, that's that's about it. <laughs> and he's always on uh, Twitter or X, whatever it's called this week. Uh, but that's he's always on. Online. I mean, I, I can't even tell you how many tweets. Like, if, if a game's on. Alex will be sending like almost a tweet per pitch. It's it's crazy to <laughs> me how on you are, but uh, yeah. So de and his insight is phenomenal. I I've always enjoyed, um, like I said, I've been uh, following you for quite some time, um, and so your insight's always really great. And if you are even have a chance to you know catch a game and then maybe have Alex's Twitter going at the same time. It's, it's awesome. I, it, to me, it, to me, it gives that kind of that 3d, like almost like having the Mannings talk during a football game, having like having a, you know, Diamondbacks game going on and then having your Twitter going, uh, it's almost like a game within a game. I, I love it. It's been phenomenal. And I, I, I and look, man, I, I'm going to be honest again, I'm a huge fan of yours. 
can't wait to see where your career goes. And and thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. Keep up the good work. Oh, I, I, again, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, please come on back and we'll uh, try to do another, uh, you know, interview here soon. For sure. Thank you, man. Thank you.